Um, thank you for bothering to come and hear me talk. So uh, my talk today is on data sharing in Australia. How does it help it suck less? So data sharing is, is quite a complex beast. Um, so we're going to run through this in it's a presentation of three parts. So the first part is how hard could it be? Um, it's data sharing. How hard could it be? And what could possibly go wrong? And then what good, what good looks like? So part one, how hard could it be? It's a question I'm sure we all ask ourselves every day. Um, data sharing is governed by a whole bunch of legislation. Um, so the legislation that you are probably most familiar with would be the Privacy Act of uh, 1988. Um, that is, that covers the Australian privacy principles, which is something which is quite important for us to all be aware of. It doesn't apply to everybody, doesn't apply to very small organisations, also doesn't apply to political parties, interestingly enough. They have a blanket exemption. Um, there's also the Telecommunications Interception and uh, Access Act. This is the bit that allows all the fuzz to wiretap your phone, um, as well as all of the data retention amendments, which passed a little while ago, which means that Telstra can also tap your phone and keep all the data for two years and then provide access to that to pretty much everybody. And there's also the Access and Assistance Amendment, which was passed at the end of last year, as people are probably aware, that means that um, you can actually be compelled to help the government to spy on everybody and then share the information with as many people as you like. The Competition and Consumer Act of 2010, um, that applies to things like apps that you might write, that you put on your phone. So that controls whether or not someone is actually getting value for money and whether they, what you said that it will do is what it actually does. Um, the Copyright Act, of course, whether or not you're allowed to put that particular meme in your presentation and whether or not you'll get sued by Disney, that will possibly get covered by, uh, by that act. My, he my Health Records Act, if you're doing anything that has to do with um, booking GP appointments or helping people with anything to do with their medical information, may get covered by the My Health Records Act if you are interacting with that system. There are also other health related things. The consumer data right passed yesterday. Um, I had to update my slides this morning to deal with this. Um, that is coming, it currently applies to banking. So if you're one of the new FinTech startup companies, you're probably extremely interested in what's going on with the uh, CDR and what the rules are going to be when they're actually out. That's governed by the ACCC. There's the data sharing and release legislation, which is coming sometime soon. Um, that's still being discussed, and that basically overrides everything else I've already talked about. Um, then there's things like the Census Act, Archives Act, and so on. Um, there's also the data matching program, which is RoboDebt and Centrelink, which I've been quite active in, and you possibly would have seen some stuff about that over the last week. Oh, that's just federal legislation, by the way. There's, there's also state legislation. Um, a whole bunch of privacy, uh, various people in different states, so they all have a different take on things. Um, that's Australian state legislation. There's also the rest of the entire world, so when, then we have the EU and the GDPR, which you're probably familiar with, and California has something similar. It applies to people who live in California, not people who live in the EU, but it's, it's actually got some pretty similar type things, so if you're doing anything online, you probably want to check that out. Um, and so on. There was stuff about the um, digital licences that was in the presentation just before mine that I didn't know about and didn't put in the list. Who's read all of those? Who's read one of them? <laughs> two? Yeah. That's all too hard, isn't it? Along with everything else to do with computers that is awful and broken, that you're already dealing with in building your products. That's how hard it is. So let's not bother, because that, I mean, how can you possibly be expected to read all of that and do it all well? What could possibly go wrong? This could possibly go wrong. Um, this lovely example was an, an app called Health Engine that was in the news. They were, it, it's, it's an app that you can have on your phone. It also has a website. So you can book a, an appointment to see a GP, to see a doctor. So if you're sick and you want to go and see someone to get help with that, you need to book it. And a lot of doctor's surgeries use this uh, system so that they can integrate it with their practice management software that basically just allows them to say, right, I want to see a doctor. There's a booking open at 12 o'clock. And it comes across and goes, yes, cool. We'll see you at that time. And it sends you a, a confirmation message to your phone. All very cool and normal. Trouble is, one of the questions that they asked at the time was, 
were you injured, is this an injury, and were you injured at work? And if the answer was yes, they would share information with lawyers, personal injury lawyers, who like to go and sue people for if you got injured at work. So they were using that as lead gen. People got kind of grumpy about that. Who knew? <laughs> so yeah, don't do that. Um, also Health Engine. They had a lovely idea that what they wanted to do was something called practice recognition system. So on their website, they allowed people who'd seen a doctor and say, well, you've seen the doctor and you've experienced their service. What did you think about it? Would you like to write a review? So it's basically TripAdvisor for doctors. Why? Why would you do that? But anyway, they did. The fun part was that in the review that they put on the website, in the HTML on the website, it showed up some of your booking information about why you'd seen the doctor. So it was leaking some quite sensitive personal information about the people who'd done that, aside from the fact that they were actually selectively editing and not putting up the ones that weren't very complimentary to doctors. So, yeah, they don't do that anymore. Wonder why? You may recall uh, Medicare, um, Department of Human Services wanted to share some data. Um, okay, awesome. This is a public, this is public data that's being held on us but by the government, so it's a public resource. We should share that so that more people can benefit from that. So they took a 10% sample of the Medicare data set, which is every time you see a GP and they bill it to the government and say, what, how much was this? Um, what did you see us for? Also the uh, pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which is when you go and get a prescription filled with your pharmacist for a drug that is paid for by the government, they keep data on that. So let's share this data. People can go and do amazing, great data things with this. And they made it anonymous, or so they thought. So they de-anonymised it, just not well. So some smart boffins at the University of Melbourne figured out how to reverse engineer it and re-identify a whole bunch of people in the data set, including individual people and doctors. So they pulled all the data offline pretty much straight away, um, not before a whole bunch of people took copies of that data. Um, there was also legislation that was mooted immediately after this to make doing that illegal. Didn't pass yet. So that's something else that can go wrong. Um, so that was, that was the result of what happened with that. It actually got pulled and there was an investigation and now there's a whole bunch of people who are quite gun shy about whether or not we can share that data at all. Should we share that data at all? So the risk is not just that you'll actually expose data from people, that you'll then cause people to not want to do this again in future. Um, there was another data breach. The, what day is it? Oh, it's probably Tuesday, it's 11 o'clock. We've probably had a three already this morning. This one was the Red Cross Blood Service who uh, were using a service provider, as I'm sure many of you do in your, in your business and, and when you're writing applications, you don't do everything yourself. You get help with people. That involved taking some of the customer data, personal data about people who were, see, who were donating blood and providing that to a service provider. In this case, what happened was that they had a MySQL database backup that they accidentally put into a public web server directory. Oops. <laughs> That's sort of inadvertent data sharing. We probably don't want to be doing that. Um, another data breach, which was, again, an external service provider which was providing expense management services to a whole bunch of people, government and private corporations. They got hacked. Um, we had hackers hit ANU, and ANU, in this case, were keeping 19 years of data on people which all walked out the door to whoever hacked into them. ANU has lots of people who deal with government because they're based in Canberra. Can't think of anyone who'd be interested in people who might end up working for a defence agency and would be interested in 19 years of historical data about you and what you got up to at uni. Who was a really good person at uni and never did anything possibly nefarious? <laughs> I distinctly remember forgetting that, Your Honour. It all stems from the Pokemon problem. Got to catch them all. Everyone is keeping way too much data about way too many things all the time. Stop it. Stop doing this. I keep seeing articles being written about data is the new oil, how it's all this ma magical, valuable stuff. Really? Data is the new oil. Data is the new asbestos. 
Stop keeping people's personal data. It's a liability. It will get you fined. We saw that with Equifax, although they've run out of money to pay people for the fines. Stop. Stop collecting the data. That is the big thing. So, these are all the sorts of things that can go wrong. All right. That's not very helpful. It's fun to whinge about, but you actually need to have an idea of, well, what do we do? What should we do? So let's have a look at what good looks like. It doesn't look like this, right? This is the problem you have when you're collecting too much data about everybody. It's just junk. So much of the data is noise. There are billion dollar companies whose entire reason to, uh, for existing is to help people sort through their garbage to find the one piece of valuable information that's in there. And you keep writing software that is creating more noise. Really? Do you need this data? Why do you need this data? Ask yourself this question much more often. Why are we keeping this? What is it for? Because good design isn't when you've continued to add things, right? Something's finished not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Simple systems are much easier to reason about. Don't add things for no reason. Don't just make it complicated because it's fun and cool. And yes, it is fun and cool to write these big complicated systems full of Kubernetes and you know, multiple, multiple distributed systems that run across the entire world, right? There's one company on Earth that has problems the size of Google, and you probably know the name of that company. Amazon. <laughs> Harsh. Also, when you're collecting this data from people, what if it's personal? Ask them. So much of this data is just slurped up by your phone, saying, well, actually, no, I need that data because I want it. It's like, well, have you considered asking people? Often, if they know what it is and they know what it's for and it provides benefit to them, they'll say yes. Like, if I need to use a Maps application in order to get me from A to B and find the location of the conference, I need to tell it where I am so that it can show me. Oh, hang on, you've gone left when you should have gone right. No, I don't want to go via Albuquerque. That's OK. What's not OK is I want to show you an ad every four and a half seconds over the top of the map display. It's like, well, that's not useful to me. But that's what all of these applications keep being designed for. Stop doing that. Ask more. Put something in there because it needs to be there. Be paranoid. We just went through a whole bunch of reasons of what could possibly go wrong. A lot of that was because people weren't understanding or weren't sufficiently diligent about what the computer was going to do. Computers are incredibly stupid. They are shiny rocks. They will do exactly what you tell them to do, no more, no less. So someone told the computer to upload a whole bunch of personal information to a website about their medical conditions. And a lot of the time, we're not doing it on purpose. The computer is not your friend. It keeps saying it's your friend. It is trying to make your life difficult. And we're all technologists. Surely you, of all people, know that it is a miracle that I managed to get that laptop, which runs Linux, to display something AV <laughs> in 2019. And yet it's, it's totally able to keep all of that, my private information safe and secure. Really? We can't manage sound. Because it's designed by humans. And this is the problem. You need to remember that this is being designed by humans. Humans are fallible. We make mistakes. We're terrible at things. And all of the stuff that you're building, well, you're not building everything yourself. It's also connected to the stuff that everyone else in this room is building. And they're humans who are also terrible and make mistakes and mean well but screw it up. And your stuff depends on all of their stuff and if any one component of that goes, goes awry, then the data could leak and instead of sharing stuff that you wanted to share, you might be sharing the wrong things. So keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate stuff, right? We don't need to run full enterprise agile process or whatever this is. <laughs> this is not necessary. Keep it simple. Let's have a look at some good examples of people who've actually done this well. Now, I like to rag on the government a lot, as people who know me will know, um, because as we heard in the last talk, that OzGov cannot computer. Um, they're pretty famous for it. Neither can private enterprise, so none of you are off the hook. <laughs> 
But let's have a look at some good examples. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics, despite getting some things a little bit wrong, the data that they collect and then share is awesome. Go and spend some time on the ABS website looking at stuff. It's amazing what you can find. And they do a really good job because they are extremely careful, partly because there are some very, very strong laws in place to make them be careful. So things like if we are going to put out data and there's only two or three people in that particular cell, we won't do it because that could expose individuals and that we don't want anyone to know that those three people who happen to be between the ages of this and this in that particular mesh block have HIV. So they won't do that. But they will still share aggregate statistics which are incredibly useful in a lot of different circumstances. So fabulous. Good job, ABS. DataGovAU, similarly mixed bag, but there is a lot of really cool stuff that DataGovAU is trying to do. They are providing data sets to people like us that we can then go and mix and reuse and do awesome stuff with, build new applications on. So that's, that's worth doing. Again, it's underpinned by some pretty strong legislation. Ostley, awesome organisation. I am a big fan. I spend way too much of my time looking at legislation with Ostley. Now, you can go and get this as public information from, say, Parliament Info with the Federal, uh, Federal Register of Legislation, but it's really hard to use. It's typical kind of government interface stuff. Ostley puts an overlay over that, makes it searchable and linkable, and you can find who cited what when. Very cool, worth checking out. Trove, amazing. Goes and digitises a whole bunch of um, uh, newspaper articles and magazine articles from the last 100 years or so, fully freely available that you can go and search and find. Um, there's a guy by the name of Tim Sherritt. He does a whole bunch of amazing stuff with Trove. So for examples of what you can do with data which you then provide and share back to people, Tim Sherritt has some fabulous, idea, uh, fabulous things that you can do. Um, Oren, I only became aware of them this week. Uh, they, similarly, they will take ABS data and then overlay that as a map on top of things. So this particular map shows, I think, the incidence of cancer in and around the uh, Sydney Basin. That's just one of the maps you can do, again, fully free, online, and they have an API. Super cool. Um, Rosie Williams has uh, created a site called osgov.info, which takes a whole bunch of, again, these open data sets, overlays stuff over the top of it to create new insights. So this uh, shows a number of contracts that were awarded in various years um, via the information that's on Oztender. Oztender is sort of transparent about what government is up to, but Rosie has taken overlays on that to provide greater insight to what's actually going on, such as the number of people who get awarded contracts and what the value is, so who got the most number of contracts in any given year. Right to know, I'm a big fan of them as well. This helps you to write um, freedom of information requests, which you can then send to various government agencies or anyone who is governed by the Freedom of Information Act in order to show, for you to get information from other people. And they help to orchestrate that whole process so you don't have to remember when the stuff should have come and what is the next uh, step in the process. Another thing I highly recommend, which again was only published this week, um, this is a cartoon guide to digital ethics, which covers a bunch of these data sharing issues and what you should consider. It's a primer, it's quite simple, but it's a really good, easy to understand beginning to how to deal with all of this. Um, well worth downloading. And there's other people who can help you. You don't have to do this all by yourself. You can go and get information from the Australian Information Commissioner. So there is what is the legislation that you need to understand? How do you do that? How do you do it well and safely? There are those in, uh, in New South Wales. There's one in Victoria. Uh, there are also private organisations. I will rep EFA. I'm on the board. Yay. Um, there are other organisations that are really into this and would love to help you to understand how to access data, keep it secure and to share it with other people in a way that will keep you safe and will keep your customers safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>